So, hello to everyone. I'm Yael Green from Imubit, and today we're going to talk about migration from Python 2 to 3 in one go. So just one word before we dive in. Uh, Imubit does deep learning process control. We bring the next generation of process control and optimization to the world of oil and gas. And if you're interested, um, come ask me after the lecture. So what are we going to talk about today? We'll talk about strategy and plan. We'll talk about uh, our environment, about how the show must go on, and how to expect the unexpected. So I'll start with telling you our story. The date was the end of 2018. Our code base was uh, seven projects, all in Python 2.7. Our software team was six people, some of them sitting over here. And we had running projects and playing customers' site. And then, one day, we got this message. Yeah, I'm sure some of you have seen it also if you chose to sit in this hall. And, yeah, we began on our mission to migrate our code base to Python 3. So we had uh, two main goals doing uh, the transition. Our goals were to continue ongoing development and minimize impact on products and customers. These main goals uh, dictated our migration strategy. So you can say we wanted our developers to continue working as if the migration didn't take place, and we wanted our customers to not know about it at all. And that's why we uh, decided to support Python 2 and 3 simultaneously. That is to write code that can run in Python 2 and run in Python 3 and give the same results. So first we'll go over the uh, migration steps. We'll talk about the general overview, and then we'll dive into the actual um, plan. So first of all, what's the first thing you should do? You should choose your Python 3 version. Uh, what version to choose? This is dependent on what dependencies, what uh, external libraries you, un you use within your project. And you probably want to choose the highest available Python version that supports all your libraries. Next thing you want to do is to divide your code base into small projects. Why are you doing this division? Because uh, our migration is uh, for each project individually. So the idea is you migrate each project on its own. Uh, in small parts, you convert your project into Python 2 and 3 code. You push each part once it's ready. And when you're finally done, you deploy that project and move on to the next one. So you do this for each one of your projects, and when you're done, uh, then uh, you finished moving all your code base to Python 3. So now we're going to dive in a bit deeply about how to migrate a single project. But before you change any line of code, there is preparation that you can do. So uh, first, you want to choose a project conversion order. Um, any ideas? Someone wants to... Um, Guess what could be a good order for your conversion? That's right, easiest first, right? Um, there's another point that's important in choosing a project. Okay, so um, if you imagine uh, your project dependencies um, like a tree, then you want to choose a, a low leaf. You want to choose a project that is not dependent on any other projects, and preferably other projects are dependent on it. That's one point. And another point is that you want to choose uh, an easy project. That's right. So you want to choose one that has um, a high test coverage. The next thing you want to do is, if you have time and you can afford it, is to increase your test coverage. This will make the conversion uh, much easier and safer. And next, you want to verify support for library and dependencies. So uh, I put a link over here you can use to um, check if your uh, libraries, external libraries, support Python 3. It's not 100% um, correct, but it's a good place to start. So once you've done all the preparation, you're ready to start the migration for a one single project. And the migration for a project is uh, test-driven, and it has um, two main parts. So first, you want to get your tests to run. You want all your tests to run in Python 3. They can fail. That's OK. It's just the first step. And obviously, you don't want to break anything in Python 2. So you want all your tests in Python 2 um, to pass. So in order to get all the tests to run, there are two main issues um, for you to address and fix. 
First one of them is uh, to fix your imports. So two fixes, uh, your internal imports, you should change into full path imports, and your libraries. If your library names have changed between two and three, then you want to import in a manner that can support both of them. How do you do that? We'll see an example over here. So the first line is an internal import that is um, imported in a full path manner. So the project is a controller and you're importing a uh, file called config. And the next two examples you see are libraries that change their name between Python 2 and 3. And this way, using the try accept import manner, you can import the correct library according to um, what version of Python you are running. Notice also the as HTTP lib over there in the middle. That allows you to use the same library name even though the library name uh, has changed. So the next issue you have to address after imports is syntax. We will not have the time to go over all the syntax differences between Python 2 and 3, but I will point out and show just a few examples for three main ones. So we have uh, the print function, we have dictionary iterations, and we have string and byte issues. So small example over here, uh, the print function, we have uh, bytes in Unicode, and we have six that allows us to iterate over items. A uh, small word about six, um, it's a Python 2 and 3 compatibility library, and it provides utility functions for writing code that's compatible in Python 2 and 3. It's really great and it will give you a, a lot of options and I encourage you to use it whenever you can. And another thing, there's a link over here for a wonderful cheat sheet that gives you all the different syntax, exam syntax differences between Python 2 and 3 and also examples how to write Python 2 and 3 uh, code. It's uh, really great, you should check it out. And once you're done uh, with um, the first step, that is getting all the tests to, to run. Some of them are also going to uh, pass. So before you move on to the next step, which is getting all the tests to pass, um, the work that you have already did in order to get the tests uh, to run, um, you've altered some code and um, some of your code is ready, some of your test has passed. What you have done so far was um, good enough for um, some less complicated parts of the code. So what you want to do now is to uh, push your changes and push your, um, and push your tests into your continuous integration uh, repository, whatever it is that you use. You don't want someone else uh, working on some other feature to uh, change and break the things that you did. And now you're ready to move on to um, the next phase, which is to get all the tests to pass. So this too is divided into um, two parts. First run futurize fixtures. Uh, Futurize has all sorts of fixtures that you run on your code. It actually alters and changes uh, uh, your code to be Python 3 compatible. And then it imports future at the top uh, of uh, each uh, Python file to make it um, also Python 2 compatible. So um, running Futurize will get some more tests to pass and some more code to be uh, compatible. That's great. Now you've reached a part where uh, most of your code is Python 2 and 3 compatible, most of your tests will pass, but you have a small amount of tests that are still not passing, a small amount of code that they are actually pointing at that is not uh, Python 2 and 3 compatible and is not trivial. So this part is probably going to take you um, most of your time and it's gonna be the most difficult, but you get better at it, so don't worry. I am not able to tell you exactly what you will find in uh, this part of your work, but I can say that um, you should probably keep in mind string and byte issues and object and uh, features and types. And the way to uh, solve uh, these issues is um, to uh, debug. What you want to do is uh, thoroughly debug in Python 2 and 3 environments in parallel and find where the flow diverges, that is probably where the uh, issue is, and you should, uh, you'll should you probably find the thing that you need to fix over there. So I'll share with you some interesting example that I found when I was migrating our code. So the two lines uh, on the top, you see a zip file, open zip file, that 
seems pretty regular. Why should that not work in Python 3.6? So um, in Python 3.6, uh, the zip file open returns a file that does not implement a seekable field, which is a field that I needed for later on in the code. And so what I did is uh, add seekable um, to the file, simply add that field. So as you can see, the solution is uh, pretty simple, right? But to find and understand what is missing um, um, was a little less uh, implicit. Um, but using a debug in both environments, you will be able to solve most of your problems. So now that you're done and all your tests pass in Python 2 and 3, you're ready to merge and to deploy. And that's it. You finished your first project and you're ready to move on to the next one. So next, I would like to talk about our environment that helped us uh, in our migration uh, project. So first of all, microservices. As I explained earlier, we migrate one project at a time. And um, since we use microservices, it, this uh, division came naturally to us. Uh, projects are non-dependent uh, on each other. We were able to migrate one project at a time. Next, continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment. Um, you will fail, we did too, I'll talk about it later, and when that happens, you want to fail fast. You want to find it fast, you want to fix it fast, and using continuous integration and continuous deployment helped us in this greatly. Next, you want to be moving in uh, small and fast steps. It's the fastest way to get where you want, and using Agile will help you with that. Um, next, working in parallel. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, debugging and, uh, and running the tests you want to be able to do that in Python 2 and 3. Uh, we use uh, virtual environments. If you use something else, that's OK. But you want to be able to work in parallel. And last, Docker and Helm. Um, we talked about uh, failing fast. So if you have uh, any problem, any issue, you want to be able to revert easily. Uh, we use Docker and Helm, and that helped us when we had to do that. In the beginning of our talk, I told you about our two main goals, doing uh, the migration, and now I would like to uh, address them again and explain how did we do it. So how did we continue uh, on developing during the migration process? So what we did is we dedicated part of the team to the migration, and the rest of the team continue um, its work uh, as usual, features, bugs, whatever it is they had to do, and only part of the team did the migration process and um, they developed the expertise. Of course, they wanted to share their knowledge with the rest of the team. So we use documents, presentations. That's good. You should do that. That helps. But the thing that helped us the most is actually to force the rest of the team to align. Um, as I explained earlier, during the migration, any code that is uh, changed and becomes Python 2 and 3 compatible, any test that passes, we push that uh, back to our, our repository and our continuous integration. And then if someone else in the team writes code that breaks a test that has already passed, if anyone else writes code that's not Python 2 and 3 compatible, then he cannot merge if he breaks a test. And in that case, he is actually forced to change his feature, to change the code that he wrote to be Python 2 and 3 compatible. And if he's finding trouble um, on doing that, then he has an expertise, he has a go-to guy. Uh, last, this might seem small, but you should mark all the changes you do in your code with a certain um, comment you decide on that will help you to find uh, the code that you've altered and help the rest of the team to find examples. So to our next goal, how to minimize impact on customers. So you want to be able to uh, find your bugs fast. We had uh, um, logs and we had alerts on our cloud applications. I'm sure you have your own ways. And next, you want to have a uh, fallback ready. So I'll share with you how uh, we had a fallback deployment ready. Uh, we use Docker, so we have Python 2 and 3 Docker files. And using uh, Helm makes it easy to switch between the images. So if we needed, we could just roll back to the previous deployment. Um, here's an example for Helm. As you can see, the images are, are, are tagged Python 2, Python 3. So if needed, just switch that 3 into a 2. and you're ready to go. So after we went through our migration process and plan, 
I'm sure you're eager to start and you're asking yourself, um, how can I estimate the time and the effort this is going to take um, for me in my project? So what I can tell you is um, just try. Choose your first project and do the migration for it and use that project in order to understand how long it will take you for all your other projects. A few things to keep in mind. Uh, higher test coverage will give you a safer estimation. And 70% of the code will take you 30% of the time and the other way around. So if you're halfway through um, migrating uh, your code, if you're halfway through the test, that does not mean you're halfway through the whole process. That's important. Don't forget to leave time for deployment and deployment testing. Uh, this might seem trivial, but it's not. And you do not want to find that out in the last minute. And last, leave time for surprises. So I would like to share some uh, surprises uh, with you. So uh, anyone know what can go wrong? The format changed, right? Right, so I'll elaborate a little bit about that. Right, so um, over here we see, we see two methods. One of them um, uses pickle to dump a data frame and the other one uses pickle to load a data frame. And as I explained earlier, um, the migration process uh, is happened one project at a time. So we had uh, a situation where one project is running in Python 2, another one in Python 3. And when you do um, pickle.dumps in Python 3, it uses the highest available protocol in Python 3, which is not the same as in Python 2. So how to fix this? It's maybe a little bit, a little bit, uh, a lot of code to, to, for you to uh, get it, but at the bottom, um, the last line, uh, when we do um, uh, pickle.dumps, just specify the protocol you want to use and choose a protocol that is Python 2 and 3 compatible. Okay, moving on to another example, another surprising example. Anyone have an idea what might go wrong here? Okay, so this one was also surprising uh, for me. Um, the Bycrypt uh, library, when you do generate password hash, it expects its input, input to be encoded and output to be decoded. This is um, extremely surprising because if you don't do the encode decode, you don't get an error or anything. You just don't get what you expected to get. The hash is not the same uh, as it is in Python 2. And in order to find out what you're supposed to do, then um, you read uh, the documentation of the library. It is written somewhere over there. So you have to go ahead and look for it. And for our last uh, example, any idea what might go wrong over here? Right, byte strings, that's, that's correct. It has to do with the bytes, right? Right, so um, data frame 2 CSV in Python 2 expects bytes IO, but in Python 3, it expects string IO. So how were we able to solve this? So we have two functions for the different implementations uh, which you need. And at runtime, according to the running environment, choose which one of them to run. Okay, so we're done with uh, our code examples and I've shared with you some surprising things that happened to us. And now I would just like to give a word of how you can expect the unexpected. So when during the migration process, you are um, migrating one project at a time. And the pitfalls might be the cross project dependencies, which you should uh, um, keep an eye on and think about. So any place where you write to the database, uh, use pickle, API serializations, those might be pitfalls. Um, so keep them in mind. So for our takeaways, um, coverage will save you. Uh, when it doesn't, you want to find out early. So move fast, continuously convert and deploy. Be prepared for a fast and clean fix. Just before we'll move on to questions, um, I'd like to share with you that we're hiring. So if you're interested, there's an email. You can come talk to me later on. And uh, questions? Right, so um, I'll just uh, repeat that if 
not everybody heard. So uh, why would you, the question was, um, why would you want to write code that supports, supports also Python 2 and also Python 3? It's ugly, and at the end you want to support only Python 3, that's, that's correct. Um, at the beginning I talked about our two goals and about the uh, migration strategy. So basically that's the reason. The reason we had uh, this phase of writing Python 2 and 3 code is because um, being a startup and working um, in a startup um, kind of uh, way, we were not able to stop everything. Uh, we're not able to stop developing. We're not able to work with customers. Um, we, we deploy a few times a week. Uh, we ha we're working with customers all the time. So we had to go through this phase, although I totally agree it's not ideal and the code can be ugly. And we, that's the reason also I pointed out at some point that we marked the places where we did changes. So um, if we want, we can go um, back to them and uh, change them. So we're going through this phase and having this over, overhead, but the reason is uh, we simply have to continue moving on uh, fast. More questions? Yeah? Yeah, so the question was, are we planning to change to Python, Python 3 only and when we're planning to do that? And the answer is yes, we are planning to change to Python 3 only. And we're going to do that in um, very soon. Now uh, we currently have um, all our code running in production in Python 3. And in another month or two, whenever we feel safe, we're going to drop Python 2. Well, the question was, was, what was our coverage when you started? And that's a, a great question. So I mentioned in the beginning we had um, seven projects and we started with the one with uh, the highest uh, test coverage, which was, I think, 85, if I remember correctly. And we finished with the project that had um, least test coverage, which was zero. So that was the project we left for last. Um, so it was different between the projects and, and really the idea is to start with a test, with, with a project with high test coverage so you can learn a lot and you um, will know better how to do this task of migrating and at the end um, and leave the projects that have uh, less test coverage to the end when you feel um, that you are more knowledgeable about this uh, migration. Uh, oh, yeah, so the question was, did we try um, to use uh, Python 6? Um, yeah, I mentioned that um, we used a Python, we used um, 6 as a package, that, um, uh, a Python package that allows you to um, write code that is Python 2 and 3 compatible. So we used that, um, uh, we used that mostly dictionary iterations in all sorts of small places. Yeah, it was very useful. It definitely, um, you should use it as well. Yeah, so the question was if we tried using the two to three tool. Um, no, we haven't. I actually, um, I read about it a bit before we started. And um, what it does is that it um, changes your code from two to three, but we wanted to go through the um, two and three phase, um, just like I explained um, earlier. So that was the right thing uh, for us. That was our strategy we chose. Yeah, so I'll just uh, repeat the question was um, about external libraries that we used. If they supported a certain version of Python, how did we uh, go about that? And did we have any problems uh, regarding that? And uh, yes, uh, when we um, started uh, the migration process, there was um, a library that we used extensively that supported Python 3.6. And that's um, the version we chose. And during the migration process, they started supporting 3.7. Um, so that, that, that was one thing that happened. And another thing that happened was um, a very uh, small library that we were using doesn't support Python 3 um, at all. And we decided um, to change the code itself that we were using uh, in order to support the version of Python that we wanted. So yeah, these kind of things could happen. Okay, thank you.